I, I'm glad to be back um, here with you guys um, in our series called Summer Bond. Um, me and, and Vince have been walking through this as kind of our, our brainchild, if you will, talking about, man, how do we desire to have this summer bod? And for some of you, you're like, what, what does that mean? Uh, what is the summer bod? Anyone going on a beach vacation? Anyone sitting by the pool this summer? Yeah, a lot of us. You know you want to show up and you want to look good. You know, you're like, I want to show up. I want to look good. I want to have that summer bod. That's the idea of, like, we, we put in work for this summer bod. Like, we, we desire it, and we want to look good. We want to feel good. So we put in work for this summer bod. And we have a verse that we've been walking through um, that kind of correlates to that idea of, man, how do we put in work in our, in our faith? So how do we work out our faith? Um, Philippians 2, 12 through 16 is where we've been um, just camping out in this series and talking about how do we have that, that body that we want, but not, not that physical body, our spiritual body, to look more and more like Jesus in, in every moment. So let's read that passage today. Um, Philippians 2, 12 through 16. It says, Therefore, my beloved, if you, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Some translations will say faith there. It says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. They may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. So in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. I mean, there's nothing in scripture that says that once we accept Jesus into our hearts and our lives, that we just get to coast. That it's just going to be easy, and we don't have to put in, put in work. See, this very, the very first part of that verse says to work out your own salvation. This means from the beginning of putting your faith and putting your yes in Jesus, that there is, there is work to do. So today we're going to focus on, on one aspect of that. But let's recap kind of, kind of where we've been in this series. So if you missed it, here's like a quick little, little update. So week one, we talked, talked about the, the mindset of working out. That in order to gain that, that summer bod, that you have to have the right mindset and the right mentality. And you have to determine if it's worth it. Is it, is it worth it? And, and in our faith, we're called to do the same thing. We're called to ask is it worth it? Scripture says to, to count the cost. See, we have to determine for us today, this morning, in this moment, is it even worth it? Is Jesus worth it? Is he our, is he our treasure? And, and if he is, is, is that treasure, is it worth it to us? This is something that we took our students to camp a couple weeks back, and this is something that hit me over the head, like, I don't even know, like something that hurts. I don't know, whatever you want to say, sack of bricks, whatever it is, something that hurts. The, the, the pastor gave this message, he said, is, is Jesus your, your treasure? It wasn't even his main point, but it's something that, that I have been stuck on and I, I cannot move past is, man, is Jesus our treasure today? Above everything else in the world, everything that, that you value in your life, is Jesus above it all? Is he that treasure if you were given a treasure map and it had all these crazy instructions and at the end you knew you just got Jesus, is, is that enough? Are you going to go through with that hunt knowing that it's going to be crazy along the way? So if you don't hear anything today outside of this, is you first have to know, is, is Jesus your treasure and is he worth it? Then last week, uh, y'all got to hear from, from Vince who is probably like five foot taller than me. Um, he, he's the man of men. I love Vince. Um, but he talked about diet. He talked about the things that we consume, not necessarily physically, but spiritually. And every day we are consuming things in this, in this world. As social media is a place where we consume tons of things. Um, what we listen to, what we participate in are things that we consume. It's our diet. And so if we take that to our, to our spiritual sense, what are, we, what are we consuming in our life? Are we trying to consume everything that Jesus has and we think that it's enough for us? 
Or do we just consume what this world has to offer and consume what this world tells us to, to live like and to be like? And so this morning, we're, we're moving on. We're leaving those two in the past. Hopefully, you're continuing on and, and learning about them. But today, we're going to talk about something that I, my, my parents used to call a cuss word back in our household, and that word is exercise. Um, they're like, that, that E word? No, we don't use that in our household, okay? Um, we're talking about exercise. So what does it look like to exercise our faith? See, exercise, it, it's got tons and tons of health benefits. It, it lowers stress, it feeds the brain, it increases blood flow, um, and it reduces the heart's need to pump even harder so your heart just gets used to beating at a faster pace and it stresses out less. So it's physically good for us. Exercise is physically good for the heart. It's, it's also good for the brain. You know, exercise actually like strengthens your brain. It's crazy. It actually keeps you more attentive. It keeps you engaged. So we're going to talk about today. How do we exercise our faith? See, so exercise, it, it literally physically, it physically shapes us. It mentally shapes us. It emotionally shapes us. It creates endurance in, in our muscles, our external muscles, but also in our heart. So in our spiritual life, there, there are these muscles that we're going to have to exercise in order to be healthy. And today we're not going to be able to like cover every single thing, every single exercise that, that Scripture calls us to. But I want to look at some things that we're going to call spiritual disciplines. Anyone ever heard that word before? Spiritual disciplines? Teenagers, y'all are like, discipline is not a word I like. Um, a lot of us, we grew up with this, this vision of discipline as we get in trouble and we get disciplined. Um, but disciplines, in, in, when we're talking about spiritual disciplines, aren't that. It's not like, oh, you've messed up, so you're in trouble with Jesus now. No, that, that's not what we're talking about. Disciplines is you discipline yourself. You say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to stay disciplined. I'm going to stay on, on top of it. See, spiritual disciplines are practices that, that are found in Scripture that promote spiritual growth in believers. It's not so that we can just be these people that, that look good on the outside, but so we can be truly spiritually healthy. And we, we kind of kicked off this year on this idea of, idea of what spiritual health is. This is just a continuation of that. Is, I mean, how can we be spiritually healthy? And I know for many of us, that word spiritual discipline can sound, can sound scary. It might be terrifying. You might have a, a bad history with what discipline looks like in your family. But see, it's nothing more than holding ourselves accountable to keeping ourselves disciplined to walk with Jesus. See, throughout all of, of Scripture, there are these disciplines, and people write books and books and books, and you'll see, oh, this book says that there's, you know, 27 spiritual disciplines. This one says there's 10. This one says there's 12. The idea is, like, there's a lot. There's a lot that Scripture provides for us for to do. Um, a couple just off the top is, how, how do we read Scripture? How do we pray? How do we have community? How do we fast? How do we confess before one another? How do we submit to God? And how do we worship? These are quickly just a couple of spiritual disciplines, and we're not going to break all these down um, today. But what I want us to do is I want us to have six principles that we, that we apply to, the, to these disciplines, and six aspects of how we can describe what spiritual disciplines even are. So the first one is this, is it's personal and corporate. So spiritual disciplines can both be personal and corporate. So first, the, the, the Bible teaches both, both personal and interpersonal. So that means like one another, right? Together, um, spiritual disciplines. See, we find those in Scripture. Um, and we find ones that we're supposed to practice alone. And we're supposed to practice together. Corporate worship can't happen without what? Each other. People. We, we can't do corporate worship without each other. See, we are called to, to pray individually. But what else are we called to do? Pray together. So we see in Scripture that they're both, both personal and they're corporate. Matthew 6, 5 through 6 says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, but they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So first we can see that the spiritual discipline of prayer, which is just one example, there's a personal aspect to it. 
to where we're supposed to get alone. We're supposed to sit before Jesus alone and spend time in, in communion and, and talking to him and receiving what he has for us. And then James 5, 14 through 15 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So when we apply this one to just the one spiritual discipline of prayer, it's also corporate. So we can see that these spiritual disciplines that we're called to live out are both for us individually, but us also as a group. We're to engage with others inside of these spiritual disciplines. See, we are in this thing together. Like, that's something that more than ever we learned when, when COVID hit, is that we are in this thing together. And being separated from each other and doing this thing alone is difficult. It's impossible. And not just so that we can just be together, and we can just exist together, but so that we can be healthy spiritually together. So that's the first one. The second one is doing and being. Spiritual disciplines are both about doing and being. See, these, these spiritual disciplines, they're activities. Like, let's not get this wrong. It's things that you actually physically have to do. You can't just wish it to happen. So let's take prayer, for example. Let's just stick there. Make that our example. In order to pray, you have to what? True question. You have to pray. Like, you, you have to do it. Like, you, you, you simply just have to do it. If you want to make something happen, you got to do it. Like, we can talk about it. We can talk a big game. Like, man, I want to get spiritually healthy. I want, I want to have a better prayer life. Well, the reality is, is that until you take action on it, it's just an idea. And so spiritual disciplines are things that you are going to have to do. It's not just the, like, the character qualities that are inside of us. They're not, they're not fruits of the Spirit. That's crazy to think about. They're not fruits of the Spirit that have given to us. They're not love, joy, peace, patience, all of that. That's not what it is. Those are things that, that come out of us as we practice these. Well, they're, they're things you do. So you, you know, if you want to say, I want to dig into God's word more, do it. You, you have to do it. It's a spiritual discipline. To, to meditate on scripture is a spiritual discipline. If you want to fast, serve, worship, study, so on and forth, so forth, all of these things are activities. Things you have to do. But see, it's also about being. So it's about doing, but it's about being. Being more and more like Jesus. See, the biblical way to, to grow and to be more and more like Jesus day in and day out is to do these things. But see, the, the heart behind it has to be right. We have to be motivated right. The Pharisees, we see them all throughout Scripture, they did... They did things right, but with the wrong heart. They practiced every law. They held it with the utmost standard. But they did it with the, the wrong intentions. And didn't honor God. And so as we're doing all of these different things, we have to remember it's also about being, and that's being more and more like Jesus, being shaped into the image of him. First Timothy uh, 4, 7 through 8 says this, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. See, the goal is godliness. See, the, the means to do that, the way to do that, is to do things and to put forth effort in these spiritual disciplines, but not by yourself. Like, know that. As, as, as you do things, it's not under your own power, under your own will, under your own desire even to do these things. It's through the Holy Spirit that he enables us to do it. Our natural state as people is to do the thing that God doesn't want us to do. Like, that's our natural state. We want to do the things that God tells us not to. And so if we want to be spiritually disciplined, we need, we need God to work through us and to enable us and to empower us to, to walk with him. But see, there's, the, there's that trap that's sitting for you to say, I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to look so good. 
I'm going to get that summer bod. I'm going to look like Jesus. But on the inside, we can be, we can be dead. And we can be broken. And so as we do these things, as we, as we practice these spiritual disciplines, we have to have the right heart. It's about doing and it's about being. The next one is this, is that, it, that the spiritual disciplines, they're modeled in Scripture. See, some of us today, like, I feel like we have this misconception that we can kind of just do our own thing, and we're, we call them spiritual disciplines. How many people love, like, being in the yard, like, and gardening? Greg, I know you do. I went to your yard yesterday. It was gorgeous. Jealous. Well, for some of us, we're like, you know what? That is my spiritual discipline. Like, you know what? Doing all these different things, that's me, that's me experiencing Jesus. Now, don't hear me wrong. You can experience Jesus while you're gardening. You can experience Jesus doing whatever hobby you want to do and you love to do, fixing cars, whatever it may be. But it's not a discipline. There is no substitute for what Scripture calls us to do. You can't say, oh, well, maybe, maybe reading Scripture works for you, but for me, I like to do fill in the blank. It doesn't work like that. If we want to grow more and more like Jesus, we need what his word says. His word describes all these different spiritual disciplines that we hold to, prayer, fasting, fill in the blank, whatever it is for you. See, the other problem this, this holds for us is it allows us to determine what we think is best for us. Like, we like to, we like to say, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do this because I think it's best for me. When scripture, if we believe scripture is truth, Scripture tells us what is best for us. It gives us clear instructions. We can't take our, our own feelings, our own desires, and form them into our own spiritual disciplines. Scripture's clear on what he's commanded us to do. Not saying you can't have a hobby. Not saying that you can't experience God in the midst of doing whatever you love to do. But it is not a substitute for what he has commanded us. The next one is this is that it is promoted in Scripture. See, a fourth characteristic of these spiritual disciplines is that those found in Scripture are sufficient for knowing and experiencing God for growing in Christlikeness. In, in the famous verse of, of 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This means that scripture is enough. For reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, it equips you for every single good work. It means this. Is that you, there might be another spiritual leader in this world that is telling you, live this way, do this this way, do that this way. There might be a, a book that is telling you how to, be, how to live spiritually. There might be a podcast that is instructioning or teaching you, like, okay, you should do this this way. You should take this. You should do this. You should live like this and remove all these different things. And then you'll be experiencing God. See, that's what the world loves to throw at us. Loves to throw all these different things that are going to benefit us. They might think that they know the best practice. But do we believe that we have all we need in Scripture? Do we truly believe that Scripture is everything we need? Everything, every spiritual discipline that we need is found in Scripture. Do we believe that today? I'm guilty of it. Like, I am the biggest proponent of reading a book or listening to a podcast. Do we have any podcast listeners out there? Love it. Like, I, I turn it on in the car. I have, like, a 20-ish minute drive to work, so I can usually finish, like, a, a small podcast there and back. I'm like, cool, I'm good. I love it. But something that God has challenged me in lately, even this past week, is not allowing these things to take substitute for what Scripture commands. There are all these great ideas and great people out there that have podcasts, that have books that are written about how we can experience God. The question is, do we know what this podcast says? Do you know what this book says more than we know what Scripture says? Because we believe that Scripture is all we need 
and to instruct us for righteousness, then we really need nothing else. I'm not saying they're not bad. I'm continue. I'm going to continue to listen to podcasts. By the way, that was me telling you I'm going to do that. Um, but where God has stretched me and challenged me is not making it a substitute. Not making it a substitute for what Scripture says. Everyone has ideas on how to be spiritually healthy, on how to live out these spiritual disciplines, on how to work out your faith. Even I, as I'm, as I'm teaching today, I'm literally giving you examples of how we can live spiritually healthy. I encourage you and I challenge you, after this message, don't take my word for it. Go find it in Scripture. Go open it up. Don't just take my word. Don't take Dustin's word. Don't take Vince's word. Take God's word. Read it. Examine it. Challenge. Challenge yourself. Challenge your mind. So scripture is everything we need. Next thing about spiritual disciplines is it's because of the gospel that we have them. See, spiritual disciplines cannot be separated from the gospel. Sometimes we like to do that, right? We like to think, you know, like, I've been saved. Jesus has saved me. I'm done. Now I have to do all these things. No, the two have to go hand in hand. It's no because of Jesus and how good he is that he sent his son to, to die on a, or that God sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross for us. Because of that, because of the gospel, because of that good news, is why I even practice these disciplines. We can't say, you know what, I just want to, I want to go deeper with Jesus. I want to go deeper with Jesus. I feel like a lot of people have that, the mentality, like, I want to go deeper. And we, we leave the gospel behind. We think gospel is the surface level, and all these spiritual disciplines are going to get us to that deeper. We, we think that, man, the gospel is like the ABCs, but I, I kind of want to, I want to read now. No, like, we, we can't separate the gospel from these spiritual disciplines. They are because of the gospel, and they are through the gospel that we even have these. They only take us deeper to understanding what the gospel is and what it means for us. I feel like we say this often is that we don't graduate the gospel. Anyone ever heard that? Y'all have probably heard that come from me. Students, I know y'all have. I know y'all have heard, you don't graduate the gospel. That's not like, okay, I got saved, and that's kind of like, that's like pre-K, Right? And then you just work your way through, and you work your way through, and you're like, all right, I'm, I'm graduated, I'm done. I'm leaving the gospel behind. Because I know it all. We can't do that. We can never lose sight of what Jesus has done for us. We can never lose sight of what God has done for us, through, because he loves us. The moment we lose sight of that is when we slip into that idea of becoming a Pharisee. We slip in that idea of like, I'm going to do these spiritual disciplines. I'm going to work out my faith. I'm going to continue to exercise. I'm going to do it. But what's, what's the reason and what's the heart behind it? And if we lose the reason and the heart behind it, we're missing the mark. The last characteristic of spiritual disciplines is this, is that it's a means, not an end. See, the end is, is the purpose of practicing these spiritual disciplines. That's what an end, the end is. And see, godly, being, being godly people is, is that goal. So we are not godly just because we practice the spiritual disciplines. That was the error that the, that the Pharisees made. They're like, I'm doing it, I'm godly, I'm good. But no, they, they were wrongly motivated. And, and that was their, their means to godliness was these spiritual disciplines. And that, that can't be the case for us. The spiritual disciplines can't be everything. The gospel still has to remain at all. It's, it's, it's a means, yes, it's a means to become more godly and pursue after Jesus. That's not the end. The end goal is to look more and more like Jesus with a heart that is right. So why? It's a question. Why do, why do we even practice these, these activities that we call spiritual disciplines? See, like athletes train themselves to, to exceed their physical limits, spiritual exercise, enables us to do what we're unable to do by our own effort. It allows us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do alone. See, when we have the Holy Spirit that empowers us, and we invest our energy with good intentions, and we develop these, these spiritual disciplines, we are partnering with God on, 
on transforming us to look more and more like Jesus. It's then that we can grow and we can produce fruit. John 15, 7 through 8 says, If you remain, re- remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you will bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. The first reason why we, we practice these spiritual disciplines is that disciplines guard the heart. When, when we practice these, these spiritual disciplines that, that God calls us to, it doesn't just change our routines or our, our behavior. It changes our heart. And it guards our heart. See, God is in the business of heart change. Have y'all ever heard, like, the idea of, like, behavior modification? That is not, that is not God's will. God's will for us is, is heart transformation. Not just changing our behaviors. See, when we practice these things, it puts us in a place where God can do what God can do. If we never meet with Jesus, if we never sit before his feet and say, God, what do you have for me? If we don't sit before his feet in prayer, how do we ever expect God to do anything? See, we have a a part to play. Even David in, in Psalm 51 says this. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, when David wrote this, he, he, he knew he had messed up. He, he lusted after Bathsheba. He had murderous plans for Uriah and rebellion against God. See, he desired a new heart, one that was full of love for God. See, sin in, sin in his life and in his heart had brought him nothing but guilt, grief, remorse, all of these things. And he wanted that, that heart surgery that only God could perform. See, Jesus cites the, the heart as good, as, as the source of good or evil. He says in, in Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Jesus also said, um, he said in Matthew 5, that you know, anyone who looked at a woman of lustful intent had already committed adultery in his heart. So David, when he did that, when he looked at Bathsheba with lustful intent, he had a broken heart. It wasn't about the actions. It wasn't about the actions that he took. It was about his his broken heart. See, we have to desire for God to, to change our hearts in the midst of the things that we do. In these spiritual disciplines, the goal is to allow God to, to, to change us. And that these disciplines themselves don't give us a new heart. They don't guard our hearts. It's, it's Jesus in the midst of these disciplines that we're practicing that does. It allows us to keep our heart in check. Say, where am I? We stay connected to Jesus in the midst of this, pursuing holiness. And we allow God to do what he wants to do. But see, not only do, do spiritual disciplines guard the heart, but they, they, also, they also guard the mind. Colossians 3.2 says this. It says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So how, do we, how are we to, to cultivate values that are above, not that are below? So we have to set our minds to it. When we practice these spiritual disciplines, that's what we're doing. We're setting our minds on the things that are above so we can forget about what lies below. We are constantly told to promote below behavior. We're talking about things that are above. We're, we're constantly told to promote this below behavior. Do what makes you happy. Do all these different things. Follow your heart. That's what the radio tells us. That's what billboards tells us. That's what artwork tells us. What everything tells us. The newspaper tells us. Whatever it may be tells us to do what we want to feel good. Anyone agree that exercise does not feel good? I know, some, like, afterwards, you, like, you get that, like, all right, I feel pretty good about that. But in the middle of it, let's be real. No, it ain't it. That, like, exercise ain't it in the middle of it. But afterwards, you know it was, it was for something good. See, we have to know that exercising our, our faith and working out our faith in the moment might not feel good. It's going to cause you to give up things that you don't want to give up. Say no to things you don't want to say no to. It's going to cause you to literally die to yourself is what scripture says. 
That's what exercising our faith looks like. It's not always going to be your first priority, but it should be. Walking with Jesus should be our first priority and pursuing him. And how we do that is the spiritual disciplines. See, if we want to be directed from above, we must make an effort to think about the things that are above. And so when we're practicing these spiritual disciplines, it guards our mind and puts our mind in a place where we are thinking about the things that are above. So today, if we desire that summer bod, you're going to have to work for it. No today is that like no one ever said that, that any of this would be easy. Scripture never said it. And if, if someone along the lines in your life has told you following after Jesus is easy, they lied to you. They lied. Sorry. You might, you might love them, but they lied to you. <laughs> they lied to you. Following Jesus is one of the hardest things that we can do. These disciplines that, that have been set before us are not easy. Picking up your, your Bible and reading every day seems easy on paper, but we all know it's not. Finding time and making time for Jesus to, to speak to us in his word is not easy. Worshiping him, showing up on Sunday. Guess what? Y'all being here this morning isn't easy. Especially y'all that have kids. Like, I don't know how y'all do it. Honestly. Like, I show up without them, and I'm like, it's a struggle for me to get here alone. I can't imagine what it is like, like having these random hoodlums that are running around that you're like, you just gotta like ring them in. I can't imagine. So even worshiping, that, that spiritual discipline isn't, isn't easy. Fasting isn't easy. All these different things that, that God calls us to are never going to be easy. But here's a promise is that they're always going to be worth it. I'm going to ask the, the band to come up. But I want us to know this morning that if you haven't even put your yes in Jesus, these disciplines mean nothing for you. If you haven't said Jesus yes, then, then reading scripture, then, then worshiping him, then doing all these different disciplines, they're in vain. They mean nothing to you. You don't understand the heart behind them. You've missed it. And so for you this morning, it might be, it might be this idea that, man, I've been working, I've been working out, I've been exercising, I've been working hard, but I don't see any change. It might be because you don't know the one who does the changing, the one who transforms. You might be doing all these different spiritual things, and I put those in quotes, but you might be missing the mark on who Jesus even is to you. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads this morning. This morning, I believe that we, we, have, we have work to do. We have exercise to do. We have disciplines to, to follow. But it's also my belief is that we have people that, that need to get right with Jesus first. That need to get right with God before they say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm going to dive into your word. Because guess what? If we're diving into God's word and we don't know the person that wrote it, it's just literature. <laughs> That's all it is. All these spiritual activities that we're doing, if we don't know the creator himself, then we are missing everything. We're working for nothing. It's like working and not getting paid for it. It's pointless. This is my hope this morning that that God would move in your heart. That you get to this point where you say, I've been working for it, but Jesus, I don't even know, I don't even know you. And for those of us that, that have already put our yes in Jesus, my hope this morning is that we can leave the yes on the table and we can pursue after him in these disciplines, but in every aspect of our life. God, this morning, would you, would you call us out, God, where, where we're lacking? God, for those of us that, that haven't put our yes in Jesus, 
but we've been working for it. God, would you reveal to us that that is not what your word says about our salvation, that is not from working, but it's a free gift that you give. God, this morning, would you speak to to our hearts and where we're at, God, where we're lacking, where we've been lazy and not exercising our faith. God, would you bring these to our attention this morning? As David said, search me and know me. God, would that be our heart this morning? Would you search us and would you know us? God, we just want to pursue after your son so we can look more and more like Jesus. So when people see, they know. And God, may we do it with a pure heart that longs for nothing more than just to know you. God, you you are so good to us. We deserve nothing. But yet you've given us everything in this world that we need for life and for godliness. God, I pray that this morning hearts would be changed. God, I pray that hearts that were that are just doing to do and are forgetting the the being aspect of these disciplines, God, they would stop and they would pause and they would realize that it's all about being. And that's where it starts, God. So allow us to be people that pursue after you, God, whatever that looks like. Whether today we're taking our first step and saying, Jesus, yes, God, whether it was 30 years ago, we put our yes in Jesus. May we take steps forward in in pursuing after you because you're worth it. God, allow us to keep you as our treasure today. We love you. We thank you. In your name.